I'm now going immediately over to Jim because we're, we're kind of short of time. And Jim, uh, Jim Reinertsen, I've worked with Jim for the last six years. He's uh, a tremendous character with IHI. Uh, he's a rheumatologist by, by background. He's also chief executive. So he's got that unique combination of clinical and managerial leadership skills. And uh, the brief we have for this session, Jim, is that we have to finish on a high. Uh, we've had two, two days of inspirational talks, and Miles has been a bit of a, a warm-up for you. So over to you, Jim. Well, thank you, Stephen. I, I, I don't know about you, but I feel pathetically inadequate um, to that task. Uh, extraordinary, Miles. I, I'm, I'm breathless and uh, almost speechless, but not quite. I, I have a difficult problem because organizations are inherently less interesting and more boring than individual people and their stories. But we just heard stories about the people extending the limits of what we think are possible for individuals. And I want to just share with you what I think is possible for organizations, in particular, to contrast what's possible with what I think is a particularly strong uh, and prevailing problem for the NHS, a focus on what's passable. And maybe it ties to the regulatory conversation we were just having. Um, Stephen and I are also going to pa pair up on this and talk a little bit. I'm going to ask Stephen to help me with it on some leadership practices for achieving the possible in organizations. Let me tell you a story about an organization outside of healthcare. Alcoa, big complicated organization, 100 plus thousand people in multiple countries around the world. This is a graph of what's possible in worker safety. Uh, the graph starts in 1987. This graph runs through 2005. This is lost workday performance, lost workdays per 200,000 hours worked. Uh, the important thing about this graph for you to note is that the, the starting point, 1987, was not bad performance. It was already better than the industry norms. In 1987, the CEO came to the organization, a new CEO, Paul O'Neill, and he declared within the first days of being there that Alcoa would become the safest place to work in the world. It is now the safest place to work in the world. You'd have to work there for over 2,000 years before you could expect to lose a day of work from a serious injury. Now, um, this speech was given by his successor in 2005, and you can read the speech faster than I can, I can recite it, uh, Alan Belda gave the speech. What's interesting about it is the level of detail that the chief executive of an organization with 130,000 employees uh, knows about the actual injuries that have occurred in Alcoa. And what's even more fascinating about this is that he gave this speech on March the 2nd, and he was reciting data through February. And this is a marker of organizations that are achieving what's truly possible as opposed to what's passable in things like worker safety. Now, let me tell you a healthcare story. This is an organization that by any other standards is regarded in the United States as a, an ordinary, typical, good hospital system. Five hospitals in the Atlanta uh, metropolitan area. You can see the details, the number of people, number of revenues, et cetera, et cetera. They have 1,243 courtesy and staff doctors, and they've set aims. They set them back in, in 2007 to cut the number of infections that occur in the hospital by half every year, and they have some mortality rate goals in evidence-based medicine. I want to show you the infection performance of this organization over the last couple of years. They were perfectly designed to produce 15, 16, 17, 18 infections of a serious type per month when they started this journey. They're now perfectly designed to produce one or two or three infections per month on their way towards zero. It's, it's been associated with an enormous amount of improvement in health. Over 125 lives have been saved during this time by this organization. Now, um, Stephen, would you tell a, a little bit about Luton's uh, story in this regard about what's possible? Thanks, Jim. We, we were privileged to work with IHI and sponsored by the Health Foundation on something called the Safer Patients Initiative that aimed to reduce the number of adverse events by 50% over a two-year period. Uh, this is a, a, a chart, a hospital standardized mortality rate chart. It's sometimes controversial hospital mortality rates, aren't they? But this, for us, was really important in showing what was possible. This was an 11% worse than national average position some years ago, and consistently now has got down to around 10% better 
than the national average through something in particular, next slide, uh, relating to the rescue of the acutely ill deteriorating patient. This intervention uh, is covered on the Patient Safety First website. I hope all of you are involved in the, the National Patient Safety First campaign. But it illustrated to us that there's a major problem in this country with uh, lack of observations of sick patients at ward level. And we got into, we, we got to stop accepting the unacceptable practice that is going on in our hospitals worldwide. And this success, I think, was due to the relentless attention to reliability in observations and the extension of a cardiac of an outreach, critical care outreach team, and some improvements in, in communication. So we halved the number of cardiac arrests, and I think that did contribute immensely to the, the death rates. The important thing about these three little stories about s worker safety, about hospital acquired infections, about cardiac arrest rates, is that the starting point of these graphs was passable. The ending point, and it's just an ongoing story at this point, the, uh, up to the present, these stories are starting to illustrate for us what's possible. I'm indebted to Joe Bibby and Sarah Garrett, back to the days of pursuing perfection, for opening my eyes to an idea that this had to do something with, about the level of ambition that we have in organizations, and also the level of scale at which we try to affect these kinds of changes. At a very small scale, and low levels of ambition, we get what's passable, and at a higher scale, we get actual transformation, especially if we aim, if we aim high. I've kind of taken that, that, that graph and converted it into a, a slightly different set of cuts around passable and possible by individual and organization, and actually by nation. We're gonna focus on the organization here for the next few minutes, but at the individual level, Passable is meeting requirements and keeping your job and you know, keeping your license and like that. The possible, and what better illustration have we just, it could we possibly have than what we just heard from Miles. It's about daring and learning and reaching and the thrill of it all is, is actually a big part of it. At the organizational level, it's about ticking the boxes and staying in business. The possible is about risk. And I really want to come back to that. It's about taking the risk of aiming high. And trust me, this is a big risk for leaders. And it's why it's not done more often. It's about growth and innovation and change. I'm not a political scientist, but I believe I have this opinion anyway that at the safe part about this, the passable part is getting reelected. Achieving the possible is about making history. It's involved in risk. Now, passable is good enough and adequate. The aims are framed using sort of required or expected as the touchstone, whereas possible has unexpected and the theoretical ideal as a reach stone. It's something that may or may not occur, although it's within the limits of capacity. You may not know it. Now, as I said, I feel pathetically inadequate because <laughs> I, I, I'm going to try to illustrate that idea of the reach stone and why it might be important for organizations with a personal story. This is my backyard. Uh, that's true, actually. I live in the Teton Mountains of, of the United States. And this, this is the Cathedral Peaks of the Tetons with the Grand Teton in the middle. And the, I want to tell you about what happened right about there uh, at that spot where I, for my 60th birthday, gave myself a, a guided climb of this mountain. I've never climbed anything higher than a windmill, and I'm scared witless of heights, all right? So you need to understand this was a bit of a problem. We, there is a point in this climb on what's called the Exum Ridge where you have to do what's called the step across. And I, you're in this spot where you have to reach for a, a, a handhold that you actually cannot see. You know it's there because your guide has gone before you and he says it is there. But you have to step on something that's absolutely minuscule. There's no foothold. The handhold is the key. And you have to confidently reach for it and move at, at, with your feet at the same time. Once you get there, you can look down. And what you see is 1,000 feet straight down. Um, that idea of the reach stone is something I want you to take with you for your organizations. If organizations are going to achieve what's possible, they often have to step across, avoid, and reach for something that they know somebody has gone before, but they cannot actually see. And there is risk involved. 
there's a risk of actually not getting there. And that's what's the thrill and, the, and, the, and also the barrier to reaching the, uh, the possible. These are seven uh, leverage points. Let me translate that into English, leverage points. Uh, <laughs> that uh, have evolved in the thinking at IHI uh, about what it takes for organizations to achieve the possible. Uh, the, the basis for the, the seven leverage points comes from the work in pursuing perfection and a variety of other studies and, and field work that have been done over the last uh, 10 years or so in quality and safety. Um, I'm not going to go through them in great detail, but I want to contrast the approaches to each of these areas, governance, the executive team, the use of attention in organizations, patients and families and teams, the finance approach to safety and quality, uh, how doctors uh, and clinicians are engaged in achieving the aims and the building of capability from what's passable to what's possible. And Stephen's going to help me with this a little bit as well. The passable side you can read. As I said, it's keeping your license, achieving targets, and so forth. It's the possible side that I'd like to illustrate a little bit more. The possible side says, no, we're not satisfied with that. Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston, major Harvard teaching hospital, the board adopts an aim, eliminate preventable harm by January 1, 2012. Um, Wellstar, cut nosocomial infections in half in 2008. Wigan, here in the UK, have the harm and keep having it. And, and, and Stephen, the, the campaign itself, no avoidable death, no the campaign, avoidable I think, harm. I think it might be the, the next slide. The, the 18 months ago, we set out a, a, a mission for the Patient Safety First campaign. How can we make it the highest priority for everyone? And how can we set some kind of aspirational goal? So in theory, 95% of acute trusts have signed up to a state of having no avoidable deaths and no avoidable harm. My trust has a business case, £2 million invested, in suggesting that if we reach 70 on the HSMR and we aggregate all the harm we can avoid with all the initiatives we're taking, we will save 650 lives and 3,000 patients from harm over a two and a half year period. So I think it is about setting some aspirational goals that we can take our, our staff with us, we can commit to with our communities. The thing is, you could pass without doing that. But this is about what's achieving the, the possible in safety. Um, in, in, in the case of the board's work, just let me pick on that for a minute, because it's so important for achievement of the possible. The board work, and Stephen, please chime in here, uh, has, to, has a lot to do with uh, paying attention and seeing the problems. Boards are, see, are hearing stories, not just looking at abstract reports on, on harm. Uh, the safety data are reviewed at each of the meetings, and the board asks the question, are we on track towards that aim of having the harm or that aim of zero a preventable harm by January 1, 2012? Stephen, any comments from your well, own Well, board? the campaign are pushing leadership really hard, our leadership intervention, uh, again, on our website. Let, let's start a board meeting with a story from a patient or from a relative. When my trust did this earlier this year for the first time, uh, it actually was a governor who came to the trust board. His wife had died in, in our hospital of cancer, but she'd acquired an infection. He told his story. The non-executive director, uh, who chaired the audit committee for eight years, financed through and through, said, we should have heard this story eight years ago. I would have changed the way I've behaved at these board meetings over that last eight years. Make it the first item on your board agendas. Devote 25% of your board meetings to safety and quality. Get out and about as directors, non-executive directors, executive directors, including the finance director. Get out on patient safety walkabouts, pre-arranged, go to a ward, ask the staff, what are the problems you're going to face on this shift? Not last year or next year, this instance, the real time, let's get into a debate with our clinical staff about the issues that face them every day and try to help them resolve them. Governance is one leverage point. The next layer of the leverage points is the executive team, the leadership team. Uh, there's no substitute for taking personal responsibility for the safety issues in organizations. Paul O'Neill at Alcoa is famous for, in the first week of his experience there, learning that a young man had just been killed in one of their plants in, in Arizona, been decapitated by a piece of machinery. 
He called a meeting on the telephone immediately with all the managers and all the plants around the world, heard the story, under, got some learning about what to do to prevent this sort of problem in the, first, in, in the future, and then said to everybody on the phone, he said, we killed him. From this day on, we are taking responsibility for these events that are happening in the organization. Um, executives in these organizations have top of mind awareness. Alan Belda, on March the 2nd, able to tell about the 11 injuries thus far in, in the organization worldwide, including the cut fingers. I think that sort of level of awareness is what's required to achieve the extraordinary. Uh, Stephen, tell us about uh, this one comment that's on this slide. I'd really love you to your, your well, view of that. Well, a few years ago, I, I went to a, a community center in Luton and heard 40 Asian women tell their stories of how they'd had a stillbirth in, in my hospital, 40 of them. None of them could speak English. They all used an interpreter to tell their stories. The aggregation, the pain, the, 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 the embarrassment around the room over what had happened, it, it made us think, well, we must be able to get to a state of having no avoidable stillbirth. And I went home, went back to the office, and had a whiteboard. And I put on my whiteboard, stop killing people. It was quite an interesting discussion point for clinicians coming into the office, a chief executive talking about his hospital, killing people who were coming into his hospital. I want to talk a little bit about style of leadership. I think we've touched on it so far. There was the question about the tenure of chief executives from, from David to, to Bruce Keogh earlier on. And we've got this cowboy theme again. I, I don't know if you can read this, but this is the... The crotch display. My partner assures me that this would be quite popular with the women. It's uh, <laughs> John Wayne and, and some of those other uh, kind of old cowboys. Um, but it talks about macho men and tough guys. And I think you might agree that the performance management culture in the NHS, perhaps over the last 10 or 12 years, has sought that kind of behaviour, that kind of, of, of just characteristic in, in our chief executives and our leaders. And I'm absolutely struck by Jim Collins in, in, Good to, in Good to Great, who talks about level five leaders and says that executive leaders build enduring greatness through a paradoxical blend of personal humility and professional will. I've seen loads and loads of examples over the last two days of that humility, but that absolute resolute determination to succeed. And I think that is the characteristic, that's the combination of characteristics that we need in NHS leadership, chief executives, medical directors, clinical, clinical leaders throughout the health service, not macho men that, that we seem to accept at the moment. Another characteristic of organizations that achieve the possible is that they channel attention. The leaders channel attention to the safety issues in their organizations. They do not hide them. They're publicly available. The data are publicly available in real time, whether it's good or bad or ugly. Um, leaders actually, with their time and their bodies, are out there showing that they care about safety, asking questions, finding out what people are running up against. And they're showing data. And I want to show you a beautiful illustration of one of the most powerful ways I know of to show data about safety in a way that conveys not just the numbers, but also the people issues behind it. This is a display of harm in an organization, uh, a Delnor Community Hospital near uh, Chicago, Illinois. We don't need to go into the details of the graph. It's a run chart of the number of patients harmed every month by a certain set of counts. And after a few months of showing this, the people uh, working on safety said to the board and the medical staff leaders, I don't think you're hearing us when we describe this. So we want to show you the same data for the last six months in another way. Oh person said, making the presentation, and the names in blue are the ones that die. Same data. This is an organization that's well on its way towards achieving the possible. This is the single most 
uh, activating uh, display method that I have seen in the last couple of years, and there are dozens of hospitals in the United States using it now. I encourage you to pick it up and use it for any of your harm displays if you think it would work. Patients and families, we've already uh, had a, a wonderful description of the importance of patients and families from Gerald Hickson and others uh, on, the, on your teams. It's about sharing power with them. We don't need to reinforce it here. This is an interesting one from Alcoa. I know that many of us are trying to figure out this conflict between productivity and other goals for the NHS right now. And it's going to be a bigger and bigger issue. It's been named here. It's been called you know, out into the open. And let's just talk about it openly the way Alcoa dealt with it. Paul O'Neill had a lot of people coming to him and saying, well, you know, is it really, does it make business sense to stop all this mayhem with our, with our employees? And he made this statement, any person that brings me an analysis of how much we save by improving safety will be fired. He didn't want anybody wasting any time on this question. He said, it's, there's no business case, there's no trade-off to be made here. This is a primary value. I think that's a stern admonition, if you will, for all of us in healthcare to stop doing the calculus on, on lives, around, at least on the safety side of this question, and ask ourselves, is this not a primary value? Is first do no harm not really one of our first principles? Engaging doctors and achieving the aim, you know, it's, it's, it's about doctors as workers and leaders of work professionally in the system as opposed to working on the system in a highly responsible way. Let me show you what Wellstar did about this. They are working on the safety agenda in a big way. And one of the things they've done is that, you know, all staff need to be trained in safety principles. The physicians hearing this said, wait a second, don't we have to be trained in safety principles? And they said, yes, we do. And they made a, a, a the physicians themselves adopted a, a policy and a standard that said by April 15th, 2009, it was about seven months in the future, all physicians on staff will have gone through the training or they won't be yet to be on staff. And I got this, this report um, from Marcia Delk, their chief medical officer, on the 16th of April. She said 1,243 docs needed to be trained. Uh, uh, by the way, about 980 of those were uh, full-time staff physicians. The others were what they call courtesy staff physicians. Uh, 1,185 completed the training, 58 did not, and were suspended yesterday. That's an organization that's getting serious about safety. They gave them plenty of opportunity, said, no, this is a real expect, and it was the doctors who led that uh, charge. It wasn't led by administration or somebody else. The final thing we see in organizations that are achieving the possible is that they don't get stuck on the technical improvement agenda and building capability there. They are very focused on the cultural capabilities. They recognize that improvement is the product of your technical ca capabilities multiplied by your cultural capabilities. And it doesn't matter how much Lean and Six Sigma and all the rest of that you know, if your cultural capabilities of zero, the product of this is still zero. And that's really been a major theme of this conference. Going back to Alcoa, Paul O'Neill, who I truly admire as being one of uh, our great leaders, uh, he made this statement when asked, he said, so Paul, now that you've had this experience at Alcoa, a lot of other places, what can you say about what are the markers of a great organization? And he said, in a great organization, every person can say every day that I'm treated with respect by every person I encounter, that I have the opportunity to do something meaningful, to make a difference, to make the world a better place, and that when I do, somebody notices. I think that's a great marker of what's possible. We have a, a conference here that's been just extraordinary, entitled Risky Business. And what I would ask you to think about in, in, in considering what's possible is to go into the risky business of achieving what's possible in safety. I know there's sort of an oxymoronic <clears throat> statement, but there it is. Get into the risky business of achieving what's possible in safety. Thank you.
Jim, I think you did a pretty good job of rising to the challenge set, set by Miles. So I'm now going to close this, our session and hand over to Alan Goldman. Thank you very much. Um, it just leaves me to, we've had a fantastic two days, to just say some thank yous, because I think it wouldn't happen without that. Firstly, to our speakers, um, been absolutely outstanding and challenging us, but it's the time they give up. It's Jim, it's Peter, Tom, all get a phone call saying, can you come give a 16-minute talk? It's going to take three days out of their lives. So it's a huge ask to them, and I, I thank them enormously. I also want to thank our chief exec, Dr. Jane Collins, for supporting this venture, um, which is also unique. Our collaborating centers, and we know who all of them are. There should be a slide soon. Um, and Fiona Godley from the BMJ, um, we've had tremendous support from for running this conference. And also my other employers, the NHS Institute, who've given me time and support to do this. Um, and is an organization where one can go to and get many of the answers of how to actually do this. So I'd encourage you to look at that. But really the, the, the support team for the conference is the Institute of Child Health support team. Um, Claire, Christina, Charlotte and Catherine have done a remarkable job and are basically saints, but have been incredibly motivated. But more than all is Ash, who's the head of the ICH events. Um, and Ash, um, if he doesn't, I think he'll probably survive to drinks before suicide. But he's absolutely been fantastic. He, he stopped answering my emails, the detail. Then I realized to get a message to him, I had to get it in the subject content of the email. And then I saw all those weren't being answered, so I started texting him. And when my text started, stopped getting answered last week, I knew mm, it's at the edge. <laughs> <laughs> to Tony and Guy um, and Tessa, thank you very much for all your support uh, with this adventure. And King's Place have been absolutely outstanding. And Inara, um, who's uh, been our link to King's Place, also really deserves a mention. Um, I've also driven her to Point of Destruction. Many people know that's quite easily done. Um, to the extent of us talking about getting the BA simulator on a barge floating by. But, uh, um, and lastly, I think a week ago, when this was really taking its toll, up to sort of one in the morning every single night, my wife said to me, is this really worth it? And after two days today, I think it really has been fantastic, and I've enjoyed it, but I, I thank her enormously. Okay, the raffle. Miles draws, then we know it's not tricked. <laughs> John Golden here. Hey, John. And that's compliments and thanks from Sony for their reader. And the last thing is we need to end on a high note, have some fun. So there's drinks upstairs till a point, then we'll run out, you'll have to pay yourself. And there's music by um, Tom's wife, Becky, uh, who's a professional country and westerner, so we're going to have some good fun. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.